church that is so abundantly generous beyond, above and beyond ourselves. And so thank you for that encouragement. Uh, let's pray together before we open this passage. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are the almighty God, that you are the one who has given us everything. And yet you invite us as your people, as those who know and love Jesus, to serve you. God, we pray that you would continue to show us what that means. To show us what it means to be your people, engaged in your mission, to reflect the, the glory and the beauty of Jesus to those around us. God, and as we look at this passage, one that maybe challenges and seems strange to many of us, we pray that you would help us make sense. That you would understand, we would understand afresh the, the beauty of Jesus and we would understand our place in your purpose. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, while I was looking uh, around and thinking about this topic of priests and priesthood, I came across a story, a funny story, uh, about a Welsh pub that had to repent for their sins. Uh, this Welsh pub uh, had, uh, it was, sounds like one of those uh, walk into a, a priest walked into a bar jokes. But it's actually a true story from 2017 where this Welsh pub uh, turned away seven Catholic priests from their venue. Uh, the, the seven priests uh, arrived at the City of Arms Hotel. It was later on the Saturday evening and they were coming to celebrate the ordination of one of their peers, Father McLaren, Peter McLaren. And so they found a table in this pub uh, in the corner, just sat themselves down quietly. Uh, and when they uh, made themselves at home until they, they went to order their drinks from the bar. And when they made it to the bar, the bartender looked at them and he told them the pub had a policy not to serve large groups in fancy dress. <laughs> As you can imagine, the, the priest thought that he was joking at the beginning. Here you have this group of Catholic priests who are, aren't allowed to marry, accused of being dressed up uh, in, as part of a buck party for one of their peers, which is all a little ironic. But as it turns out, the pub had experienced a number of issues over the years uh, with large groups of parties or party goers wearing fancy dress. And so rather than put on extra security, they thought they would refuse such group's service and ask them to leave instead. Disappointed, the priests uh, went, uh, started to leave the venue until one of the staff actually thought, I think these might be real priests, and invited them back and gave them a free drink to apologise. It all ended up happy. But I have to admit, as much as being hilarious, this headline, the headline of this article so eloquently put it, it said, confusion reigns as priests walk into a bar. And while it is Baptist tradition that priests or pastors don't drink, I can't help but wonder if this story highlights something of the confusion around the priesthood and around priests as a whole. Over the years I've been called, I have to admit, a number of different names, some that can't be repeated in church, but as a, a pastor I've been called a, a priest, a, a minister, a padre by a friend who worked in the army. Uh, and part of the problem I think is the perceptions we have created around what it means to be a priest, what it means to work in the priesthood and what a priest actually does. The reality is even in the church we have tended to create these distorted understandings of what it means to be a priest. We've created, often created these unhealthy relationships with our pastors. We have put these people, these sinners, these church leaders appointed by God on man-made pedestals only to watch them lose their way, to succumb to moral failure and to fall from grace. We've seen it time and time again, particularly with the Royal Commission around religious abuse in institutions and with all these celebrity pastors. And I can't help but wonder if it is time for us to identify the problem and reimagine the church and the priesthood around God's vision. God's vision when he called the priests of Israel. To pick up this story in Exodus, God, by his grace, he has led his people uh, through the Red Sea into the wilderness where they have arrived at the base of Mount Sinai, where God promised they would stop and they would have space to worship him. And it's here in this space that God comes to meet after 400 years or, or more of silence. God comes to meet and to speak with his people. And it's here God reminds them who they are, his treasured possessions. 
He reminds them what he requires of them as he calls them to unwavering obedience and then he begins to lay down the law, the moral and spiritual guidelines that would shape the lives of his people moving forward. All this lays the foundation for this incredible transition in God's relationship with Israel where more than speak to them from the mountaintop and from a distance, God prepares to pitch his tent, to pitch his tent and dwell among his people. God is going to dwell among his people and for this to happen not only are there to be various patterns to shape Israel's worship as we have heard over the last few weeks but today we come to the people who would facilitate their worship the priests of Israel now if you remember Israel's first encounter with God It was one of those scary moments that stirred up this reverence, this respect or this fear of God. And you can sort of understand as they stood at the base of Mount Sinai, God descended on the mountain in this cloud with thunder and lightning, with these uh, blasts of trumpets from heaven. And it was a moment when the people realised who God is. That God is holy, that they were sinful. And so they asked Moses, they begged Moses to approach God on their behalf. It's what Moses did at the beginning, isn't it? He was the one who had liaised between the people and God, and yet God, in his wisdom, had another plan, where in preparation for the tabernacle, he set apart priests, priests who would serve as mediators between himself and his people. And as we discover this privileged role of peace, to stand between God and his people, to be, represent God to the people, and the people to God would fall to Aaron, Moses' brother. And the high, as the high priest and his four sons as the ministering priests in the tabernacle. They were chosen to stand before God, to offer gifts and sacrifices on behalf of the people for their sins, to intercede in prayer, to teach people about God, to help them know and follow the law and to gather in those who had gone astray. And so the priest's job, it was complicated and yet it was a significant role And so as we see in this passage, they were given special clothes to wear. These clothes are outlined in chapter 28. If you've got your Bible, you're welcome to follow along. As we see the garments prescribed for Aaron and his sons as the priests of Israel, it says, Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honour. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve as me as a priest. These are the garments they are to make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold, blue, purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. It's an incredible description. And the first thing we notice about these special garments is they served a purpose. They were given as a sign of dignity and honour or some translations say of glory and beauty. These garments would reveal to the people of God who the priests were, who had been set apart by God, not for their own glory, but the colours as we see, these royal colours that match the curtains of the tabernacle is so that they would reflect the glory and the beauty of God to the people as they moved around the community. I have to admit, I never really thought about these robes having a purpose. You see all these fancy robes in different churches and I thought that's just part of the show. And yet here we see, even my Sunday best as you can see, it doesn't communicate anything near what these robes would communicate to the people of God. Uh, Actually thinking when it comes to our tax return, every year uh, we pay the annual visit to our accountant, a friend of Jess's family. He, He doesn't go to church and so every year for the past 17 years he has asked me the same question. Do you wear any special robes? Any sashes or any clothing with the church logo, because if you do, you can claim it as a tax uh, write-off. As much as they sound like some pretty fancy threads, with all these royal colours, I have to admit I'm pretty happy I don't have to wear a robe to church. But these robes, they not only served a purpose for the priests, to set them apart, to show who they were, 
But as you read through the list of items, every piece of clothing carried a reminder about the role they had been given, about the God whom they served, the people they were called to represent, the royal colours that ran through their clothing, such as purple, scarlet, gold, served as a reminder that God is sovereign, that he is kingly, that he is clothed in majesty, that he is perfect and holy. And then the ephod, in case you're not up with 13th century BC fashion, Sort of that waistcoat you you might be able to see. The waistcoat made in royal colours and instead of an extra shoulder padding or two like we have in our suits, they had these two onk stones that were engraved. They were engraved with the names of the sons of Israel. A reminder of where they had come from. There was the, the breastplate of judgment with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel engraved into stones that hung at the bottom as a reminder of their sin and their brokenness, their burden before God. And then they wore this turban with a gold plate, the words, Holy is the Lord, engraved and bound against their forehead as a seal, a sign of being set apart by God. A sign that they were to be holy as they entered the tabernacle, to be holy as they represent God's people, to be holy so the people of God could be accepted and welcomed before God himself. Then along with the sash and their cap, their linen undergarments, the robe of the ephod was this blue robe that came down to their knees and hanging on the bottom were these bells and pomegranates. So I was trying to picture this, actually, the pomegranates hanging off the bottom of your robe. And if the bells stopped ringing when the priest went into the Holy of Holies, you knew something had gone wrong. The priests had been struck down dead. Because as the people of God knew, it is a fearsome thing to enter into the presence of the living God. See, the reality is for these priests, like all of Israel, the rest of the people of God, they are not holy. They are not righteous. So left to themselves, they fall short of God's glory. They fall short of God's beauty. They fall short of the standards that God has laid out for his people, which brings us to chapter 29, the consecration of the priests. Now, when it comes to consecration or ordination, as we often refer to it, things have changed radically over the past years. When I was ordained about 10 years, a bit over 10 years ago, my first couple of years here at Campbell, uh, there was no robes, there was no sacrifices, there was no special fans here. We had a, a gathering of Baptists from all around Victoria. I shared my sense of God's call and in confirmation, some of the people from here at the church at CBC and, and the wider Baptist family laid hands and prayed on me. They laid hands gently and prayed for me. And, and that's what's happening in verses 1 to 9. They're gathered in, the priests are gathered in, prepared for ministry, and consecrated before the people of God and God Himself. I have to admit, more than my own ordination, uh, the patterns of Exodus actually take me back to life on the farm where we used to butcher our own sheep. And what we need to realize here, though, is each of these sacrifices serve as a reminder a reminder of, of the sin. A reminder that sin is so powerful it takes death to break its hold. And so begins this pattern of sacrifices, doesn't it? This pattern that will continue in generations to come as uh, as they seek to atone for the sins of the priests and the the sins of the people. A bull is to be sacrificed as an offering, a sin offering, and to purify the altar. Two rams, one as a, a burnt offering in verse 15, and the second as a ram of ordination in verse 19. And this was to happen every day for seven days. That's what it took to make an unholy people acceptable to God. So we see in verse 36, it says, Sacrificable each day as a sin offering to make atonement. Purify the altar, making atonement for it, and anoint and consecrate it. For seven days, make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. Then the altar will be most holy, and whatever touches it will be holy. So as you can imagine, the the priest, the role of a priest, is a messy job. A bloody job. Every day on behalf of the people, they were required to offer animal sacrifices, drink offerings, grain offerings, food offerings, burnt offerings on the altar, and then to go into the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and represent the people of God in prayer. To represent them in the presence of God. That's what it took to make the priest holy. 
It's what it took to keep the people of God holy. It's what it took for God's presence to remain among his people. It's pretty full on, isn't it? It blows my mind to think about all the sacrifices that were required to deal with people's sin. But there's more going on here than just the removal of sin. You see, this word atonement literally means at one moment. And so this is about restoring relationship between God and his people. See, atonement is about someone who is disconnected and out of relationship with God. Someone who has rejected, turned their back, or is sinning against God. Someone who is out of relationship with God, being restored to wholeness and to oneness with him. And to make atonement... The priests would make these sacrifices. In doing so, they opened the way for God to fulfill his promise. The promise we see in verse uh, 44 of chapter 28, where it says, So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, and I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt, so I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. This is always God's goal. That's why he introduces the priests into the life of Israel so that through their sacrifices and their prayers, his people would receive forgiveness and grace. They would enjoy his presence, relationship with God, as God would come to dwell among his people. And so in many senses, this is a summary, if you like, of the role and and the purpose and the patterns that the priests had in the Old Testament, that the priests had among the people of God. If they dressed appropriately, if they kept themselves holy, if they continued to make sacrifices day after day, the people of God would be made one with him and God would dwell among his people. Thankfully, things have changed. Thankfully, as we move into the New Testament, the good news, we have a new high priest, a better high priest, the great high priest the Bible talks about and promised in Jesus. That's what we discover in the book of Hebrews, which very much parallels this passage and and much of the book of Exodus. It beautifully reveals to us that Jesus is the one that God's people were waiting for. And we see this most clearly in Hebrews 7. In verse 11 to 14, it mentions Aaron, it mentions the Levitical system of priests that would follow, but it makes it clear that none of this was sufficient. That something different, someone greater was required. And as we see through Hebrews 7, uh, that someone is Jesus. He is the one we need because he is greater. He is greater than all the prayers that we pray. Greater than all the sacrifices that were made. Greater than all the religious patterns and traditions that we might settle into. And greater than all the priests that would follow from one generation to the next. So what makes Jesus greater? I'm glad you asked. Because that's what the rest of Hebrews 7 tells us about. In particular, verse 26 to verse 28, it says uh, in, in verse 26, He is the kind of high priest we needed. Because he is holy and blameless and unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins and the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once and for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for people's sins. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath. And his son has been made the perfect high priest forever his son the perfect high priest forever jesus is the kind of high priest we need says he was holy blameless perfect unstained by sin while all the priests were human and would fall into temptation and be subject to sin we see in israel's time aaron falls doesn't he he falls with the people into this golden calf that they're about to create in the next couple of chapters his sons are consumed by holy fire when they desecrate and disobey the laws of god in the tabernacle and we see it time and time again in our day We see it with the Royal Commission. We see it with so many celebrity pastors and and church leaders as they fall from grace. 
But not Jesus. He is holy. He is the great high priest because instead of making sacrifices for himself and for his own sin, he became the perfect sacrifice for your sin and my sin, the sins of the world. Jesus is holy and pure. And as we read before, he is divine. He was sent by God, appointed by God. In fact, he is the son of God himself. Hebrews 1, uh, chapter 1, 3 says, by, the, by his son, God created the world in the beginning and it will all belong to him in the end. This son, Jesus, perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with his nature. Hear that? He perfectly mirrors God. Stamped with his divine nature. More than a person made in the image of God, more than clothes, dressed in clothes that would reveal something of God, Jesus is God in the flesh and therefore able to represent God most clearly to us. Jesus is holy. He is divine and he is eternal. Verse 23 it says there were many priests under the old system. Death prevented them from reigning in office, but because Jesus lives forever... His priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Well, every priest in every generation throughout all of history will die. Will end up dead and buried. Here we meet Jesus, our forever king our forever high priest we meet the one that death could not overcome we want meet the one who is alive and as we read in the gospels after appearing uh, to his disciples and 500 other people he is the one who ascended to heaven to see, be seated at the right hand of the father and it is there he lives forever and what is he doing he is in advocating he is interceding he's representing us to god and God to us. That's what Jesus does as the great high priest. He lives to represent God to us and represent us before God, that we might approach God boldly, as it says later in Hebrews, that we might know him intimately, we relate to him not only as God but as heavenly Father. And yet as we prepare to respond to Jesus this morning, I want to take this one step further. As much as we've considered the Old Testament priesthood, as much as we've considered Jesus, the great high priest, I want to take a moment to consider what priesthood means and what it looks like for us as the people of God today, which takes us back to the passage we looked at last Sunday, where the Apostle Peter writes this profound and personal sense of a calling. But you, but you are a chosen people, a royal, a holy nation, sorry, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Jesus is the great high priest. And yet as followers of Jesus, we have been set apart. You have been set apart. Jesus has called us to give our lives in service to him. We are the priesthood. We are the priesthood. We have been made one in Jesus. So we can represent and reflect who God is to reflect his love, his mercy, his grace and his goodness to, in a fallen and broken world. And, and he has a, a called us to intercede or to mediate on behalf of others, to point them to Jesus, to an understanding and appreciation of his grace and his forgiveness. So together we might capture and rediscover the beauty and the blessing that he offers that he offers not just us as the people of God, but he offers all people who would turn to Jesus, who would worship Jesus, who would give their lives in service of Jesus. Back when I was a kid, I still remember getting ready to go for church. And we always, and maybe this, some of you might recognise this, we're always expected to wear our Sunday best. To make sure you looked respectable and presentable, maybe to the other families and, and maybe a little bit to God. I think I was late primary school, I was in my aqua stage, yes, I had an aqua stage, 
full aqua pants and stripy shirt. My brother and I had finished getting ready for church. We were running around outside and I slipped over while we were waiting for my sister. I slipped over, ended up with grass stains all over the knees of my pants. And it was in that moment I experienced the fear of God. <laughs> Maybe the fear of my dad who's here this morning. As I march, was marched inside and forced to change my pants to my Sunday second best, I guess. As much as we have moved beyond the Old Testament into a new covenant, sometimes I wonder if we have these strange ideas about what it means to, to make, what makes us acceptable to God, what it means to be holy, what it means to be a part of this priesthood of all believers. But as those who follow Jesus, you, we have been called and set apart for a purpose. We have been set apart as a community of priests who declare the praises of God in a dark and often difficult world. And the good news is ministering priests, it doesn't matter what you wear. So you can come to church in your tracksuit pants. You can come dressed however you like. It doesn't matter about title. It doesn't matter about position. It doesn't matter about power. What matters is the state of our hearts before Jesus. The sense of being at one atonement, at one with Jesus. Because if we are at one with Jesus, more than this human tendency To elevate ourselves, we know there is one high priest. Jesus alone is the one who can represent us before God and represent God before his people. Represent God to a fallen and broken world and in response to Jesus and in response to his intercession, we are called to love him, to serve him, to worship him. As those who have come to Jesus, placed our faith in Jesus, surrendered our lives to Jesus, We have been made holy. We are being made holy, set apart by God. To be made and and reshaped into the image of his son. So that we can be ministry priests. So we can go about our lives every day, not needing to invite people to Sunday, but taking Jesus into the places we go. Whether it's in our home, with our family, whether that's in our workplace with our colleagues, whether that's at university with the friends that we meet. We are the ones who are called to minister in those places and represent the people around us to God. And represent Jesus to the people around us. And as we do... As we seek to love and serve Jesus in those places, my hope and and our prayer is that people would see and discover and and take hold of the beauty and the truth and the relevance of Jesus and the gift of life and love and holiness that he offers. We are the priesthood. We serve the great high priest, Jesus. Jesus. I really encourage us to think about how, as we go this week, how we might represent God to those around us and how we might represent those around us before a holy and yet gracious God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this incredible image that we see in the Exodus, this image of your people and those you had called and set apart to serve you, to gather people into your presence. And we thank you that our great high priest has been given in Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, his resurrection. We thank you that he is now interceding on our behalf in the kingdom of heaven. May we remember And shape our lives according to the beauty and the blessing that we have received. And may we live as your priests. As your priesthood in this world. May we seek to point people to Jesus. May we be the ones who invite people to experience the the love and the grace of Jesus. 
May we be the ones who allow your presence to dwell intimately, not only among us, but in the hearts and in the lives of those around us. God, open our hearts afresh. Shape us into the image of your Son and, and use us, we ask in his name and for his glory. Amen.